Hello, and welcome to this Brennan Center for Justice event. I'm Osito Wanevu, a staff writer at the New Republic, and I'm thrilled to have the opportunity today to speak with journalist and author Ian Milheiser about his new book, The Agenda, How a Republican Supreme Court is Reshaping America. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. The Brennan Center is a nonpartisan law and policy institute affiliated with New York University's School of Law. We are grateful to our producing partners for this event, NYU's John Bradamas Center, which advocates for civil debate in politics and public policy. We'll leave time for questions, so feel free to leave your questions in the question and answer box. We'll get to them at the end of our discussion. Uh, Donald Trump is gone but his legacy will live on for decades through the more than 200 federal judges he appointed, including the three Supreme Court, uh, Neil Gorsuch, Barrett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. In his new book asks how these justices are going to use their power. And he presents an unflinching view of an increasingly partisan court that will enact major systemic changes in areas like voting rights, the independence of federal agencies from political interference, and the separation of church and state. And he explores how these decisions are going to shape the very nature of our government, redefining who gets to have legal rights, who's beyond the reach of the law, and who chooses the people who make our laws to begin with. So please welcome me in joining Ian Milhauser. Thank you. Uh, now, in addition to writing this timely book, in the senior correspondent in Vox, where he focused on the Supreme Court, the Constitution, and the decline of liberal democracy in the United States, all very fun and uh, encouraging stuff. Before transitioning to journalism, he was a former law clerk in the federal appellate court system. Ian, thanks for being here. It's great to be here. Thanks so much. So before we talk about where the court is going, I think it's worth taking a little bit of time to talk about the court's past. I mean, you do in this book talk a little bit about the historic decisions that you think are going to sort of point the way to where the court might be headed under conservative rule. And one of those decisions that legal scholars talk about a lot is the Lochner decision. Can you talk a little bit about the, the Lochner decision, what it is, and, and why you think it's, it's important to understand where the court might be going? Sure. So, you know, Lochner's decision from 1905, which said that maximum hour laws, and at the time, workers typically were paid by the week and not by the hour. So, like, if you didn't have a maximum hour law, they could be forced to work 16, 20, 24 hours a day. Um, it was a law that struck down a state maximum hour law for bakers. Um, it's often associated what, with what is called the Lochner era because it wasn't the only such anti-labor decision from the time. You know, there were decisions striking down child labor laws and the minimum wage and all kinds of bad stuff. The, the reason why I think that I start with Lochner is, you know, I think that the legal argument in Lochner is hard to justify as anything other than a results-driven decision. Um, you know, it rests on a very vague provision of the Constitution. And so I don't know if, our, if this Supreme Court is literally going to take us back to Lochner, but I do fear that we could be going back to an era where the Supreme Court feels empowered, you know, so long as it can write an opinion that seems plausible to five justices, they'll reach the result that, that, that they want to reach. I will say one other thing about it, which is that the way that Lochner ended was, you know, there's a big um, fight between Roosevelt and the Supreme Court. And Roosevelt could have said, this is Franklin Roosevelt, Roosevelt could have said, I'm going to appoint justice who will implement the New Deal for me. You know, he, he, he could have said, um, I'm, you know, that I'm just going to use the Supreme Court and make sure that they implement my agenda. He didn't do that. What he wanted the Supreme Court to do was get out of his way. You know, Roosevelt reacted, I think, in the way that a con the leader of a confident political movement reacts. You know, not, I need this court to do things for me. It's, I believe I have the people behind me. And so if the court steps back, then, you, you know, I believe that I will win the Democratic fight. And I will note that, you know, Reagan and Nixon, and even to a certain extent, George W. Bush's rhetoric about the court was very similar to Roosevelt because I think that they had a sort of confidence that we don't see now in, you know, amongst the sort of people who hold a majority on the Supreme Court and who are appointing those justices. So you also spend a little bit of time in the book, you know, delving into the individual philosophies of the conservative justices on the bench. I think there's a tendency to say, well, there's a conservative block and a more liberal block, there's a democratic block and a Republican block. And while that often holds true, I think holds true more and more every year. Uh, there are important differences between the conservative justices that, that might shape 
uh, specific outcomes in particular ways. Could you, so could you talk a little bit about the differences you see between, uh, the, you know, on the right side of the bench and why they're important? Sure. So, I mean, like one thing that's like always dangerous about writing a book is that you get new information after the book is published. And so I feel like I know more about the justices than, um, you know, I did when I was writing this. You know, it appears that the court is basically slipping into three different factions where, you know, you have the liberals, you have Thomas Gorsuch and Alito. And I think that Thomas Gorsuch and Alito, there are methodological differences. You know, Thomas and Gorsuch claim to be originalist, which means that they have a methodology that they use that just tends to produce conservative results a whole lot. And Alito, frankly, I think tends to just reach the result that he wants to reach in, in at least in politically charged cases. And then you have this middle block of Roberts, Kavanaugh, and Barrett. And I don't want to, you know, minimize how conservative that middle block is because they are extraordinarily conservative. But like there does seem to be an emerging sense amongst those three justices that there has to be more than just will to power behind what the court is doing. You know, there were a number of cases in the lead up to the 2020 election, most of them before Barrett got there, but Kavanaugh and Roberts were there, where the Supreme Court basically changed the rules for any people had already cast their ballots. And Thomas Alito and Gorsuch's position was, if you cast your ballot and in a way that violated the new rule that we just announced that you couldn't possibly have known about because we just announced it, sorry, you're disenfranchised. And, you know, Roberts and Kavanaugh seemed to realize that that was a bridge too far. So, you know, I don't want to minimize their conservatism. Roberts and Kavanaugh were still joining many of these opinions limiting voting rights, but they at least felt that there was some kind of fundamental fairness that had to be in play here. You, you, you can't change the rules and then retroactively take rights away from people. Right. And one of the things you, you said that was interesting in the book um, was that there are also general uh, in the conservative legal community where Roberts seems to be the bridge between two different kinds of perspectives. Um, and somebody like Gorsuch represents the other end of a, of a spectrum. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, no, this goes back to what I was saying earlier, how like I thought Reagan was very confident. I mean, he won two landslide elections. He had no reason to think that he needed the Supreme Court to do his work for him. Um, and so I think that, you know, and this isn't just true about John Roberts. I think there was a generation of conservatives who lived through the Warren court who lived through Roe v. Wade and experienced the trauma of knowing what it's like to just really disagree with a decision that the, that, that, that the court had handed down. And those conservatives, I mean, if you read what Scalia had to say in the 1980s, it's very similar to what I have to say now about judicial restraint. You, you, you know, I mean, those conservatives developed, you know, a very coherent and frankly, very persuasive theory often of you know, why we want the courts doing less work. If you're Neil Gorsuch, you know, Gorsuch, I, th I think he's like 45, I, I should pull up his Wikipedia page and find out the exact, but like, he's young. And because he's young, he has not really had the experience of, you know, every time he's been disappointed by the Supreme Court, it's been because he wanted them to do more than it actually did. I mean, I think that's probably even true about Obergefell because Gorsuch, like, you know, while I don't think the Obergefell decision hasn't shown any signs that he is personally anti-gay. So like, I think that if you're Gorsuch and you spent your whole career just being mad when the court has done less than you wanted it to do, then you want the court to do more, 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 and you want it to do now, 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 now. And that's not just Neil Gorsuch's experience. I mean, that's the experience of any one of like, any conservative lawyer, any member of the Federal Society in their 40s and 50s, that's been their life's experience. They, they, they've spent their whole career being mad that the court wasn't doing more to implement a conservative agenda. And so there's no longer, you know, Roberts, I think, is the last bridge to that older 
philosophy of the court that's a little skeptical of judicial power. You know, Roberts isn't old enough that like he was probably all that aware of Roe v. Wade when it was handed down. But, you know, he was a young lawyer in the Reagan Justice Department and sort of apprenticed at the knee of people who were, you know, who believed in that kind of conservative judicial restraint. So, you know, the, the book is kind of structured to focus on four particular areas that you think are really uh, areas that the conservative court is going to make a huge difference in the years ahead. Uh, voting rights, administrative law, religion, uh, and what you call the right to sue. Um, and we should probably start with voting rights since that's what's on everybody's mind right now. Everybody's looking at what's happening in the South before the People Act is, is moving through Congress, we hope. Um, but you say that voting rights are, are underpinned in this country by really four legal pillars. Can you talk about what those pillars are and, and the specific ways each of them uh, might be threatened by a conservative court? Sure. And I mean, this is, you know, I, I know that there's probably a lot of voting rights attorneys in this audience, including folks from the Brennan Center. So I will preface this by saying this is a bit of a simplification. But, you know, basically, before the Roberts Court got its hands on it, um, there were four different ways that you could win a voting rights case, you know, if, if you believe that law disenfranchised people. You know, one was that you could just show that the law had like a did tremendously more to disenfranchise people, or at least more to disenfranchise people than it did to actually achieve some kind of benefit. It was, you know, there was, there was a kind of balancing test. And that balancing test is still technically good law, but in a case called Crawford, um, which involved a voter ID law, the Supreme Court at least allowed the voter ID law to go into effect, even though there's no real evidence that you know, the thing that voter ID laws is supposed to prevent, voter fraud at the polls, really exists in any meaningful numbers. You, you know, the, the, the Supreme Court itself in the plurality opinion in Crawford was only able to identify one example of in-person voter fraud, I think, in the last 150 years. Um, so it's, it's just not a problem. And if you leave the balancing test nominally in place, but you say, oh, yeah, you can still have a law that you know, does nothing to solve a real problem, then I don't know that the balancing test really has much meaning anymore. And then the other thing is that there's three prongs of the Voting Rights Act. Um, the first is preclearance, which was that states with the history of passing or localities with the history of passing racist voter laws had to preclear, that's the term of art for it, um, their um, new election rule with officials in Washington, D.C. And the idea was just to have someone look at it, make sure it wouldn't do something racist before it, you know, it actually went into effect. Um, and of course, the Supreme Court effectively neutralized preclearance in the Shelby County decision. Um, there's something called the intent test, um, which is you know, basically what it says, you know, if you intend to discriminate people on the basis of race, the law should be struck down. But in a case called Abbott v. Perez, the Supreme Court put such a high burden of proof on plaintiffs alleging racist intent that it's almost impossible to win the case. And, you know, and then there's something called the results test. Um, if anyone here has had to litigate a case under the Gingles standard, you have my condolences. This is a very, very complex and probably needlessly complex area of the law. But the short version is that it means that some laws which have a disproportionate impact of voters of color will also be struck down. And there's a case in front of the Supreme Court right now called Burnovich, which could potentially eliminate the results test. Chief Justice Roberts has fought against the results test literally his entire career. You know, President Reagan signed the bill that wrote the results test into law, and Roberts was the point person within the, within the Justice Department trying to convince Reagan not to do that. Um, so if you don't have preclearance, you don't have the intent test, you don't have the results test, you really don't have meaningful protections against racist voter laws. And the reason why that matters so much is that, you know, if you look at, you know, every poll that I've looked at for a recent election, um, African Americans, typically 80 to 90 percent of African Americans will vote for the Democratic candidate. And about 60 to 70 percent of Latinos will vote for the Democratic candidate. And that means that if you are, say, a state lawmaker in Georgia, and you will want to identify where the neighborhoods are that have lots of Democrats in them, you can use race as a proxy 
to identify those neighborhoods. And then, you know, you can know that if you cl close down a bunch of polling precincts in those areas and suddenly people have to wait four hours in line and you're not allowed to bring them water anymore because that's a crime, that the people who get frustrated and leave because they have to go to work are probably going to be Democrats. Yeah. So moving on to the, uh, the administrative state and just sort of thinking about recent headlines, the Biden administration, for instance, announced this week that it wants the United States to have our carbon emissions by 2030. Um, given the way the Senate is, uh, it doesn't seem like we're going to have a major climate bill pass uh, unless things change dramatically. So that project of reducing emissions is going to be a job for the administrative state, for regular, federal regulators. Um, you talk a little bit in the book about the Clean Power Plan as one example of the ways in which a right-leaning court can constrain the capacity uh, of the executive to, to you know, regulate carbon emissions and do things that we wanted to do. So, so talk about, you know, where the court is going on that front. How are the ways, how, how might it constrain the Biden administration's ability to work around Congress to implement a uh, new policy? Yeah, no, thank you for that. So there's basically two different ways that Congress can regulate. So let's say that Congress wants to get power plants to produce less polluting emissions. One way it can do that is it can just pass a statute saying every power plant has to install X device and that device will reduce the emissions. And that might work for a while, but the problem is if, that, if Congress had passed that law in the 1970s, that technology would be obsolete and the law might even be counterproductive because it could prevent the plants from installing more up-to-date technology. And so the other way, and this is, this is what the Clean Air Act does, the other way that, 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 that Congress can regulate is Congress can announce a policy. The Clean Air Act says that certain power plants have to use the best available te technology to control emissions. And then it delegates to the EPA the task of constantly monitoring new technology, figuring out like, you know, when something else has emerged that is now the new best available technology. And then it promulgates what's called a regulation, which requires the power plant to use this new technology. And the neat thing about this sort of regulatory process is that it is both democratic and dynamic. It is democratic because the Clean Air Act was still passed by Congress and signed by the President of the United States. You know, the, the policy, the best available technology should be used, was still determined by the people's elected representatives. But the task of implementing that policy as the facts on the ground change are delegated to a, a body of experts who you know, can make sure that the law is dynamic and as, you know, new, as technology changes, they, they can update their regulations. Um, when I cover the Federalist Society, this is the thing they care most about. I mean, more than anything. You know, I, I attended a Federalist Society conference once where literally every panel had someone on it who was complaining that whatever they thought was bad um, was happening because of an out of control administrative state including the panel on religion. So they really care about this. Um, and the leading proposal to roll back agencies' power to regulate um, comes from Gorsuch. Gorsuch is a frequent villain in my writing. Um, he, the opinion here is called Gandhi. It was technically a dissent, but five justices have since signaled that they agree with him. So it is a majority opinion in waiting. Um, and I'll just read what Gorsuch said in his Gandhi opinion. He said that a federal law permitting agencies to regulate must be, quote, sufficiently definite and precise to enable Congress, the courts, and the public to ascertain whether Congress's guidance has been followed. Now, I don't know what that means. That's a really vague standard. And the thing about vague standards is that when courts hand down vague standards, they are delegating power to themselves. You know, if, if there's a law that says, you know, the speed limit is 65, everyone knows how fast they have to drive. If it says everyone must drive a reasonable speed, who's going to decide if you're driving too fast? A court is going to decide after a cop pulls you over because they thought you were driving too fast. Um, and so vague standards effectively delegate power to the one unelected branch of government. Um, and that's what I'm worried about is that the Supreme Court is in the process of giving itself a veto power literally over any regulation, you, you know, because the standard is vague enough that I, you know, virtually any regulation could potentially be struck down. And I'll say one other thing, which is that in the 1980s, conservative judges, like the, the, the 
the most outspoken defender of judicial deference to federal agencies in the 1980s was Antonin Scalia. Uh, you know, when Reagan was president or when George H.W. Bush was president, you know, they, they were thrilled to have Ronald Reagan's EPA, you know, which for a while was led by Neil Gorsuch's mother, um, you know, deregulate um, power plants, you, you know, engage in deregulation. Um, it's only now that, you know, in a world where Democrats have won the popular vote in seven of the last eight presidential elections, that we see conservatives on the court, um, you know, lacking the confidence that I discussed before, you know, wanting to impose their own veto power over the regulatory state. Right. So, you know, you say that Gorsuch shows up uh, as a villain in, in your writing a lot. Uh, and so not, so not to harp on him too much, uh, but one of the areas where he also shows up in, as a villain is in uh, maybe in religious freedom jurisprudence. You talk about Masterpiece Cake Shop and his opinion in that decision being a kind of uh, sign of where the court might be going, a kind of leading indicator of where it might be going uh, on religious rulings. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, again, you know, the danger of writing a book is that events sometimes overtake you. Like, you know, Gorsuch has basically won. Um, you know, one of the really, so one of the surprising things about this court, and I, I don't know why this is, I mean, I have some ideas why, is that they've shied away from a lot of hot button issues. You know, there, there's a big abortion case that's a perfect vehicle to overrule Roe v. Wade that, you know, every week it, they talk about it at conference and every week they do nothing with it. And I don't know why, but like they, they've decided not to jump right away into abortion. You know, they decided right away to um, not, they decided not to jump right away into guns. There's a big second amendment case that, you know, for several weeks now it's come before them in conference. They're like, yeah, we're not going to do anything with this. But on religion, not only did they, you know, I mean, there's the Fulton case, which was argued a while back, which deals with an even, well, which is actually an even more radical argument than the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. You know, the Masterpiece Cake Shop case involved the question of whether a private business owner who objects to LGBT people on religious grounds is allowed to refuse to serve them in violation of a state anti-discrimination law. Um, the Fulton case involves a government contractor who wants to get a government contract and then not follow the terms of that contract, which include an anti-discrimination clause because they object you know, to gay people on religious grounds. And I mean, that's extraordinary. Like, I mean, it has always been the case and the, the Supreme, there are explicit Supreme Court holdings saying that the government has more control over its own contractors than it does over other people, because when you're a government contractor, you are doing work on behalf of the government. Um, but in any event, what has happened in the last several weeks since Barrett got there? You know, all these decisions were five to four in one direction. Barrett got there and they became five to four in the other direction. There have been a ton of cases involving churches, other houses of worship, you know, one case I think involved like just people who wanted to gather and pray in people's homes, and they wanted to do so in violation of public health re regulations or public health rules that prohibited too many people from gathering because of COVID-19. And when Roberts was the pivotal vote, Robert said, look, like we want to defer to public health officials here. I, you know, I, I, I don't know how many people are going to die if I give these plaintiffs what they want, and I don't want to be responsible for that loss of life. Um, after Barrett got there, there's now a five justice majority to say that religious plaintiffs with a religious objection to a law can get an exemption to it, even when we are literally talking about life and death. I mean, even when we are literally talking about can a regulation whose purpose is to prevent a deadly disease from spreading. Um, and that's, that's just extraordinary. I, I, I mean, like, I, I, I won't say that I, I didn't see it coming because I was around for the Hobby Lobby decision, but the court moved very, very quickly on this once, once Barrett got confirmed. And then the last area that you really turn your attention to in the book is, again, what you call the right to sue. You deal with arbitration uh, in that section of the book. And that's not an issue that gets as much attention as these other areas. Uh, it's a little bit wonkier uh, 
Um, but can you talk about uh, why arbitration is such an important thing to follow at the court and, and maybe a little bit about Epic Systems and, and what that decision represented? Sure. So, I mean, I think next to the chapter on voting rights, which, you know, if you don't have the right to vote, you don't have anything. I think that the chapter I wrote on arbitration may be the most important chapter um, because, you know, Congress can pass all the laws you want. You know, you can pass an anti-discrimination law, you can pass a minimum wage law, you can pass safety laws, but those laws are enforced by courts. And if you can't get into court in order to enforce the law, then you don't really have a right at all. It, you know, it, it, it's, it's just, you know, some words on paper that folks are free to ignore. So the court has allowed really potentially any business or almost any business to, as a condition of doing business with that company, um, they can require you to sign away your right to sue, so that you have to go to a private arbitration system. Often the arbitrator is chosen by the corporate party in this arrangement. And there's all kinds of, of, of studies showing that arbitrators are less likely to rule in favor of plaintiffs who are seeking to enforce their own rights. And when plaintiffs do win, they win a lot less money in arbitration than they, than they would have won in a, in a real court. Um, the scary thing about these arbitration cases is that they are completely atextual, you know, and, and there's two there's two cases here. One is the Epic Systems case that you mentioned. The other is an older case called Circuit City. And basically what those cases say is, well, first of all, what the Federal Arbitration Act says, like that's the law that all these cases are, you know, grow out of, says that the Federal Arbitration Act does not apply to workers in interstate commerce. Um, and if you're familiar with like the history here, which I go in, into in the book, interstate commerce is a very broad phrase, the way that it, the, the way that it is used now. But in any event, it says that workers engaged in interstate commerce are not subject to forced arbitration. And the Supreme Court held in Circuit City, and then again in Epic Systems, Epic Systems you know, said that um, even though there's another law, the National Labor Relations Act, which seems to say that arbitration shouldn't be allowed, that law doesn't apply either. But the holding of those cases was that forced arbitration applies to workers in interstate commerce. Like it, it's the opposite of what the statute says. And I just... I mean, like I could, I, I could describe the court's reasoning to you if you want. I mean, it's it, it's very complicated, and it's you know, and it goes down a lot of weird turns. But like, you know, s you know, setting aside the point that I made earlier that if you can't sue, you don't really have any rights. Like, if we can't trust the court to follow the explicit language of of a statute. Then what are we doing? You, you know, if, if if Congress could pass the For the People Act and the court could say, oh, where it says that you can't disenfranchise voters, we're going to read the word can't to say can, then like you, you, you don't have a system of law anymore. At least you don't have a system where like the elected branches are relevant to what your laws are. And then the last thing I think we should talk to before we turn to audience questions in the next couple of minutes is solutions. And I should preface this question by saying that Michael Waldman, the president of the Brennan Center, has been appointed to President Biden's commission uh, to study Supreme Court reforms and isn't working on Brennan with these issues. Uh, but from your perspective, Ian, given we have a Democratic control of Congress, we have a Democrat in the White House, what options should be considered right now um, to, to balance the court and, and prevent it from going further to the right and, and protecting well, all the rights you talk about in the book. Yeah, L let me start with, I guess, the most radical solution, which is adding seats to the court. You know, there's a, there's a bill in front of the court that would do that now. I think court packing is a dangerous tactic. I, 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 I think that if you, this bill passes and suddenly there's 13 justices, the governor of Texas isn't gonna say, well, I guess the court's new majority says Roe v. Wade is good law, so I'm just gonna follow it. Like that's not gonna happen. There's gonna be massive resistance to everything that the court hands down. So like, I think that is a dangerous solution that comes with a very high price. I also think, you know, I wrote a piece several years making this argument that if the court doesn't allow our, de our democratic process to function, then you have to pay that price. You know, if, if the court is really going to dismantle our voting rights so that we cease to have competitive elections in this country, then that I think is the trigger point where you pay that terrible price, um, in, you know, in order to save our democracy. Um, what I hope happens 
you know, the word nuclear is thrown around too much um, in D.C. Like, I don't think there's anything nuclear about, like, changing the Senate's rules with a simple majority vote. Um, but um, the reason we have nuclear weapons, the reason why the United States has nuclear weapons is so we never have to use them. They're a deterrent. They're so China or Russia or whoever won't attack us because they know we can annihilate them. And what I hope happens is that the fact that this threat is looming out there causes folks like Roberts and Kavanaugh and Barrett to say, maybe this isn't the right time for us to dismantle what remains of the Voting Rights Act. So, you know, you know the threat of a nuclear deterrent can potentially be very powerful. If that doesn't work, or, you know, let's assume that the court just decides not to do all the things that I'm worried that they're gonna do in the voting rights space, um, then I think the solution is you just got to win elections and, you, and you've got to keep winning elections. Um, I think Joe Biden is being very smart in that if you look at the polls on economic issues, we are definitely, we're a center left country, you know, 70% of the country um, generally has left of center views on economics. So that is a whole range of opinions from Bill Clinton to full communism. But, you know, there, there is, there is a seven, there's a center left majority on economic issues on cultural issues. And by cultural issues, I don't mean abortion. I mean things more like so-called cancel culture. Um, I think that the polls show that conservatives have a slight advantage. It's not huge, but they have a slight advantage. And what Biden, I think, has done very smartly is he hasn't thrown the cultural issues under the bus. Like, you, you, you know, like he's still taking the sorts of positions that liberals take on those issues. But he's also made himself much less of a cultural touchstone than our previous two presidents. You, you, you know, Barack Obama was the preeminent pop cultural figure of our era. Like, you know, you know, if, if, if he passed a big bill, he'd be on Jimmy Kimmel the next day celebrating it. You know, when he when he wanted people to, um, you know, to sign up for um, for the for the Affordable Care Act exchanges. He went on between two firms. Like Obama really tried to be very culturally present in our, in our lives. And as someone who admires Barack Obama, I really enjoyed that. But if you're someone who didn't like Barack Obama, it's not hard to see how that made it possible for a Trumpian backlash to build. And so what I think is so interesting about the Biden presidency is that he's still fighting the battles that matter, but on the sort of cultural conflicts where he, doesn't have to be present in them. He's going out of his way not to be present in them. And I, and I think that for this moment in American history, that's that's the right strategy. So we have a lot of really, really great questions coming in from the audience. And I think one of them, the first one I wanna take on actually touches upon what you've just raised. Um, so can, can Mr. Milheiser comment on the current justices views on affirmative action in higher education, uh, Fisher, uh, et cetera, and the Supreme Court's likelihood uh, of taking up that issue. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a case involving Harvard that's making its way up through the courts right now. I think it is, I mean, I, I think there's actually a cert petition in the Harvard case before the justices. I think it is inevitable that they're going to take the case. And I think that it is extraordinarily likely that the Supreme Court is going to strike down affirmative action in, co in college admissions. And, you know, and not just in, public college admissions, private college admissions as well. You know, Harvard is a private university. Um, I mean, I've been surprised before, you know, one of the dumber things that I, that I have said in my career is um, I was an editor when the first Fisher case um, came before the court. And one of my writers asked me how much focus we wanted on this. And I'm like, well, you know, we should cover it. But I think that affirmative action is doomed. Justice Kennedy was pretty clear and Gruder that he doesn't like it. and you know, I, I was proved wrong. Like, I, I think that Kennedy surprised us. Um, that said, I think what remains of affirmative action just isn't all that significant because what the court said in the second Fisher case is they said that you can have an affirmative action program, but you have to use an extraordinarily expensive and time-consuming method in order to sort through applicants. And you have to be constantly monitoring your own processes to make sure that they are not like, they don't take too much account of race, basically. And 
because the court said that they have to be constantly monitoring their affirmative action programs, it means that someone like Ed Bloom, who's the very rich guy who funds a lot of these cases, can just keep bringing harassment suits against the same university over and over again because they have to be constantly monitoring. Maybe they didn't monitor well enough. And, you know, if you're Harvard, you know, Harvard has such an enormous endowment that they are willing to pay that price. And I'm, I'm glad that they are willing to pay. And by here price, I mean a lot of money in order to maintain their affirmative action program. But, you know, I mean, I don't want to say that if Fisher were overruled and affirmative action were declared illegal, that that would have no consequences. But I think that the Supreme Court has already made it so difficult for an, a university to have an affirmative action program that like, you know, unless the university is both very wealthy and very committed to it, it's just difficult to maintain an affirmative action program. Yeah. Another question deals with something that you actually spend a lot of time in the book talking about um, the shift or the apparent shift for people who are just sort of watching the news uh, between conservatives espousing a philosophy of judicial restraint to a situation where conservatives really seem to be judicial activists now. You've talked about this a little bit, could you, but could you talk about some of the historical or ideological factors that produced that shift? Yeah, I mean, well, I, I go back to what I said before, which is that, well, so from when Nixon became president until now, almost every justice appointed to the Supreme Court has been more conservative than the justice who replaced him. Ginsburg was an exception. Sotomayor was arguably an exception, although Souter to Sotomayor wasn't a huge shift. Um, you know, Stevens to Kagan was probably a wash. But like, you know, there are no examples of a justice being confirmed in that period who like, well, I mean, I don't know if there's any, if there's another example in American history where you had the, the shift in ideology you had from Thurgood Marshall to Clarence Thomas. Um, but, you know, you, you had Thurgood Marshall be replaced with Clarence Thomas. You had Ruth Bader Ginsburg being replaced by Amy Coney Barrett. So the court has been marching inexorably to the right this entire, you know, for the last 40 or 50 years. And so it doesn't surprise me that, I mean, I say younger, I mean, conservatives who are my age and a little older, you know, conservatives in their 40s and 50s now think like, why would I want judicial restraint? You, you know, the, 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 this court, like, I don't, I don't fear them. I want, I, I want them to do more because, because things have been marching to the right. And I'll say one other thing, which is that the reason we are in this mess is because our constitution is anti-democratic. You know, Donald Trump lost the popular vote by nearly 3 million votes. Um, at no point during the Trump presidency um, was the block, did the block of senators who, or like the block of Republican senators represent more people than the block of Democratic senators. And that, that's still the case. Right now, I, I feel like I might've put that confusingly, but like right now, there are 50 Democrats and 50 Republicans in the Senate. The 50 Democrats represent 45 million more people than the 50 Republicans. Uh, you know, in seven of the last eight presidential elections, the Democrat won the popular vote, but that hasn't, that doesn't mean that Democrats have held the White House for all but four years in that period. Um, you know, and so my, my point is, you know, at a certain point, you have to believe in democracy. Like, if Trump had won fair and square, and if Mitch McConnell had been Senate Majority Leader, because that's what the American people really wanted, then I think it would be on very weak ground in saying that, you know, there's a problem with Amy Coney Barrett being on the Supreme Court. There's a problem with Merrick Garland not being on the Supreme Court. Um, but the reality is that if we chose our leaders in free, or fit, free and fair elections where every vote counted the same, we wouldn't be in this mess. We, we, you know, we, 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 wouldn't, we wouldn't be in this mess at all. Um, and so ultimately the question here when you look at the Supreme Court is whether you're going to allow a political movement that only represents a minority of the country and you know, only represents a minority that is disproportionately white um, you know, to, to essentially govern through the, the one on elected branch. Another question, how should we think about the, the 
continuing role with the Federalist Society in shaping the court. Um, there was, I think, a brief moment where, you know, I think after Bostock, where people kind of asked the question, well, what is the Federalist Society good for anymore on the right? There was a lot of angst and anxiety about it. Um, but can you talk about, you know, how that institution changes as, you know, as the court is dominated by conservatives and it seems like they've won? Is it just sort of places for, for an opportunity for more people to be disappointed by what the court does, you right. know, instead of trying to get people onto it? Yeah, like the, the Federal Society, I think, does three things. So the first thing it does is it just hosts a bunch of events. And like some of those events are really interesting. I mean, you know, my, my, my confession for this, for this event is that, you know, back in the Bush years when I was in law school and when conservatives really did believe in judicial restraint, I would attend Federalist Society events where they would talk about how we, you know, who would raise many of the arguments I have raised in this panel or, you know, in this event um, in favor of judicial restraint. And secretly I was thinking, gosh, like I don't have a good rebuttal to what they just said. So, but like, I think that the forward facing part of the Federal Society, I mean, it, it's interesting, but I think it also exists to give legitimacy to the less forward facing parts of the Federal Society. So the less foot forward facing is one is that the Federalist Society kind of provides career Sherpas for, um, you know, people who, you know, have conservative views where, you know, if you are a 1L at Harvard and you're really smart and making really good grades and you're conservative, they will identify you pretty quickly and they will give you opportunities, you know, provided you hew the party line. Um, and it, you know, it, it, it provides them with a bench of potential nominees that they can be pretty confident are going to be intellectually pure in a way that I think liberals do not have. Um, so that's really important. But then the other function that the Federalist Society plays, you know, Maya Sen at Harvard has, is the one who turned me on to this theory, is that professionals care a lot about how they are viewed in both in their like social circles and in their professional circles. So like, you know, in 1980, if like the Harvard Law Review, Pat, you know, published a law review article just dogging some opinion by William Rehnquist, like, I don't know that William Rehnquist would, would change his mind, but like, he probably did care about that. Like, you know, he did care about what other smart people in his profession had to say about what he was doing. Um, now what the Federal Society does is it provides a safe space for, um, for conservatives. It means that if you are Brett Kavanaugh, you can, you have spent your whole career surrounded by, you know, a social and professional circle that will reinforce you are doing the right thing when you hand down decisions that most people disagree with. You know, you know it means that when Brett Kavanaugh goes out to dinner with one of his law school classmates, you know, that's the reason they're still friends is probably because they came up in the Federalist Society together. And so Brett Kavanaugh is gonna get reinforcement for what he's doing rather than having this person say like, you know, is it really a good idea to say that we should strike down COVID restrictions, you know, or, or, or whatever. So that's the role that I think the Federalist Society plays. I think that we liberals want to do two of those things. I think that, you know, we want to have, um, you know, public facing events are great. I'm doing one now. And I think that, you know, career Sherpas are a good thing. I would love to have had someone who like helped me get a clerkship when I was in law school in the way that I would have been able to, you know, get a clerkship very easily if I had the exact same um, law school transcript, but I, uh, you know, but I was a conservative. I don't think we want, liberals want the third thing though, because like in the end, like I think we want judges to be impartial. Like, you know, I want Justice Sotomayor to be basing her decisions on what she thinks is the correct answer under the law and not based on what like a circle of friends tell her when she goes out to eat. 
Well, that is, I think, just about all the time that we have. Uh, I'd like to thank Ian for a fascinating and extremely depressing conversation, <laughs> but uh, informative nonetheless. Uh, a link to Ian's book, The Agenda, How a Republican Supreme Court is Reshaping America, published by Columbia Global Reports, can be found in the chat. Our thanks again to our producing partner, NYU's John Bradma Center. I'm Osito Wanevu. And a quick note from the Brennan Center before we leave you, uh, stay up to date, but on key issues impacting our democracy with weekly analysis and insight from Brennan Center experts. Sign up for our briefing letter at brennancenter.org slash briefing. And we look forward to seeing you at our next event. All right, that was great. Osita, thanks so much. Yeah, I thought that was uh, a great and wide ranging conversation, even though 